My name is Matthew Maslanka. I'm it's David Maslanka's son. I'm being joined by Jeremy Reynolds, who's professor of clarinet at um, University of Denver Levant School of Music. And he has just released a two CD set of basically everything dad ever wrote for chamber clarinet. And it is just a stunning piece of work. And I am grateful to be able to talk with you about it today. So thank you. Oh, Matthew, thank you so much. Uh, this has been a long time coming and uh, thank you for speaking with me. And anytime I can talk about um, your dad's work and, and working with him and stuff, it's uh, yeah, it, it's, it's my, it's always my pleasure. So it's great. Fantastic. Uh, why don't you tell me a little bit about how this thing came to be? Yeah. Well, um, so a very good friend of mine, Peggy Dees, who your dad also knew quite well. Um, she was integral in, uh, in getting the eternal garden off the ground. Mm -hmm. She was the, I think the leader of the commission project, <coughs> excuse me. And, uh, and she contacted, uh, no, we met actually, um, doing a recording session done in, uh, in Florida for, I think it was Carl Fisher and, uh, we became really good friends and, uh, and she roped me into the commissioning project for eternal garden. And, um, and that's kind of where things got kicked off. And so. Um, of course, as a student, I had played, you know, several of the wind quintets, um, you know, in, in school. And of course, you know, the wind quintets are all the rage and a couple of the wind symphonies as well. So I was really familiar with your dad's work, but I wasn't really familiar with the chamber stuff, as you said. And so um, one thing led to another. And um, I, I was actually teaching at Northern Arizona University at that time that I started just to sort of collect all this music. I, I reached out to your father. I may have even reached out to you. I don't know. That was back in 2000, uh, maybe 2007, 2008. So I don't know if we started uh, corresponding back then. But um, so I started collecting the music. I actually ended up going back to perform at the Tucson Symphony for two years um, and then uh, ended up coming here to Denver, University of Denver. And, you know, the being a, a rather, you know, junior faculty member and learning all about academia and the tenure process, you know, I saw this as just like the ultimate tenure project. Like I'm going to do this and this is going to get me tenure. And that's like, I, I, I was very, <laughs> I was very like, you know, like, you know, like just like tunnel visioned. Right. Um, but honestly, I mean, it just, you know, it, I, I thought about, I, I actually contacted Jerry Junkin at one point at the Dallas wind symphony and asked if you would be interested in recording uh, the first concerto. And I think that was before he wrote the second one, I believe. And of course, I mean, actually, Jerry was uh, at the time he was really on board, but he told me what the budget was and that just would have blew my budget. You know, I had I had twenty thousand dollars to do this project. And so uh, that would have blown the project. So I, I scaled it back just a touch um, and ended up doing these seven pieces. You know, 20,000 sounds like a lot until you actually start doing things and it goes real fast. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, for the first CD, for the solo CD, <clears throat> um, we flew up to Missoula. Um, we did a recital at the University of Montana, and then the next day we actually worked with the dad on all of the solo material, all the solo rep. Um, and Heidi and myself, we flew up to Missoula and we were up there for several days. Um, and then we recorded it uh, that following, I think that was probably in November or maybe even October that we went up to uh, Missoula. This is and in 2013? This was in 2013, yeah. yeah. And then we recorded it in 14. I think I'm almost certain. Yeah. And then the next year we flew your dad down to Denver because uh, it was a heck of a lot cheaper to fly him to here than to fly all four of us up to Missoula, um, which was all, which is also really spectacular. He was actually in residency here for, I think, maybe a week, week and a half uh, at the Lamont School of Music. He worked uh, the wind ensemble, did a piece or two of his. He did a couple of seminars with the composition students. And of course, he you know coached us on, on, on the trio music. <clears throat> And we did, we did a recital. I, I planned the recital while he was here. Um, and the one thing that I wanted to do actually, and I never could, uh, I didn't really pursue it full enough. Um, and I think the levels of the recording would have been so totally different, but your dad actually spoke the words of Gringo in be before each movement. And he was on stage mm -hmm. while we were performing. And um, <clears throat> we have, I mean, we have a recording of it here on our, I you know in our archives, but the, the level of the recording would have been so weird. So yeah. I, I I didn't pursue it, but 
I just think it would be really neat to have his voice, you know, before each before each movement. Um, we have it here for anyone who does uh, who does have uh, access to our archives, the students and faculty. So so his his voice will forever be in our be in our ears and in the halls of uh, of the school, which is pretty cool. But um, so yeah, so that's how that's how it all sort of came about and how we ended up recording it. And um, you know, I. I we worked on it. We, we there was actually uh, it was interesting that your dad actually asked us to just record it and go. Yeah. And I understand now why he wanted that. Um, I really do. And it's probably taken me, you know, at this point to really understand um, a lot of his approach and, and what he felt about his music and what he felt about, like the energy of a room and how each performance can be very unique and very special into itself. And. And it's, I, th I think, um, I imagine that, you know, he just wants, he wanted everyone to experience the music at that moment in time. Right. Um, and so, but I have to tell you, we did very little editing. We, we really did. We did very little editing simply because of your dad's use of the piano sustain pedal. Yeah. And that creates a lot of problems. Um, a lot of problems uh, with the intensity and the energy in the room. So I actually we I, I, I did make sure in the in the recording in the liner notes that we we indicated that very little was done at your dad's request, um, uh, simply so that people would know that um, that you know first of all this is what he wanted, but I mean I couldn't go you know into into depth of why, but I'll tell you that darn sustain pedal on that piano I mean <laughs> I, there, were, there were so many times where. Well, no, not so many times. Every once in a while, we would have a take that would just be even more special than the last one. I mean, really, you know, but that darn sustain pedal, it just, it was, it was amazing. But I think because of that, what happened <laughs> is that you really hear what your dad ultimately wanted, you know, and that's kind yeah. of, that's kind of ironic, ironic about the whole thing, you know. The really interesting thing about doing whole movement takes or whole piece takes is that you are alive in the energy through the, the whole arc of the thing. And when you start chopping it up into little bits, then it's easy to lose the power yeah. as you go forward. That's exactly right. Yeah, that's exactly right. And uh, as I'm listening through the recordings, it's so clear that you guys are absolutely focused yeah. and it's a, it's a special thing that doesn't happen very often. And frankly, like it's clean as hell. <laughs> it's like you, you guys are nailing this. So it's not even like we have to edit around a bunch of sloppy playing. Like yeah. It's you, you have put in the time to make those single takes work. We did. I mean, first of all, I mean, I, I have to give major kudos to Heidi and to Basil and to Yumi because they sunk their teeth into it. Yeah, they did. Uh, I mean, you know, I remember, <laughs> I remember so vividly and I don't know if Yumi would remember this, but there was some stuff that your dad wanted to, like that he wrote, you know, and he was working with us and she said, you know, do you want it this way? You know, and and he said, well, you know, how, what do you want? Like, how do you feel? And I just remember just watching the whole thing. I wish I had like a camera and a Polaroid of just the whole thing to watch it. And, you know, and and and, and he, but what I think what you're hearing is also what he did. I mean, it was really it was his inspiration. It was his it was his working with us. It was his challenging us, you know, and, and he really did. I mean, because he sat there and he would not tell you me exactly what to do. And it wasn't that he was being stubborn. It was just he really wanted. I mean, again, I mean, I, I hope I'm not speaking out of turn or or trying to read too much into stuff. But I really felt that he was really asking her to f to find out or to figure out what the music meant to her and how did she want to play it and how did she want to put her voice in in conjunction with what he wrote and 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 the inspiration and stuff like that. So, I mean, it, it really I have to say, I mean, I, I've had you know, this will definitely be in the top five, if not the top <laughs> experiences of, of my career. I mean, seriously, it was, 
it's something uh, that I I'm, I'm very proud of. It was it was amazing to work with your dad. It was also a treat at that time. You know, like you know, as a student, you know, the infamous David Maslanka, you know, like the the music and the man and and all this stuff that all us wind players just you know we just you know just wanted to sink our teeth in. And so you know, I mean, <clears throat> even though I was here and you know getting more and more established in my career you know i still saw him as you know like this you know like you know this this um, this you know composer that was almost unreachable you know yeah that i remember as a student so that was also a deep thrill um to be in the same room as him and um, he really he really meant a lot to me and 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 really to all four of us i know heidi there was a time that he came back to colorado a couple years later <coughs> excuse me I wasn't able to go up to Boulder, but Heidi drove up and they sat next to each other and they had dinner afterwards. Um, he came over to Madrid. I actually have a picture that I, I, in my phone I was trying to find for you that, that I can send to you. But he came over to Madrid um, to hear us play the three pieces and the fourth piece. Um, but I actually think it was more inspired because I think your mom wanted to ride horses on a Portuguese beach. Yes, she did. Yeah. So I, they did that on that trip, I believe, whatever special kind of horses indigenous to Portugal. So I think they made like a double trip out of it. So, um, no, they, they, it was really awesome. And I think I really hope uh, our intent is, um, that we are, we are performing, you know, basically from his mouth into your ears, you know, into his, into his mind, into his world, into his approach, into, um, into, you know, our world now, you know, in, you know, forever, hopefully um, the trios are, I don't know anyone who knows the trios, honestly, I really don't. Um, I don't know if it's because they are so terribly difficult um, or I'm not really sure, but not a lot of folks know the, the trios. So one of the interesting things about the trios, like not only are they from a period that nobody really gets into, but they're right. also for, um, a more it's not an obscure group of instruments but you know so the music itself is just sublime though yeah it's really it's really wild and i think you're absolutely correct and if you can correct correct me if i'm wrong but i, I like even in the solo cd even the three pieces and the three pieces are also from a time where we're not really familiar with and and i think that's the time that he lived in new york was that correct before he moved to montana yeah uh, we moved out to Montana in 1990. Yeah. So most of this music was written before then. Right. Um, everything but Eternal Garden is a New York work. Right. Right. Um, I actually wanted to maybe get into a little bit of the the music. Sure. And I, I was struck by... So a lot of the music from this time is characterized by extreme violence. Yeah. Like it's, you know, very, very loud, very angular. Um, like the, the music that is, like he is frustrated yeah. with a lot of how his life was going and um, his, his inability to, to be himself effectively. Okay. Um, and you really get a sense of him kind of banging on the edges of maybe the universe and the boxes that he was in yeah. using the materials that he was able to use. Uh, I wanted to start off with the second movement of the three pieces, listen to a little bit. I knew you were going to play that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, hey, it's uh, so...
So uh, you are really going for it. <laughs> we really went for it. And uh, it's, yeah, we went for it. Um, and I, I, you know, Matthew, I have to tell you, I mean, the, the, it just, one of the other, all these little anecdotes is that when we were working with their dad in, in, in Missoula, he just, have a, he just kept on saying louder, 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 louder. And when it was, it was, he was so dialed in, like you said, it was almost as if he was reliving that moment, you know, and you could, you could, I could, you could see it in his face and you can feel in his energy and, um, you know, most people have worked with him, you know, would probably say is he's a relatively quiet guy. Yeah. <laughs> but but that almost that silence and in, in the experience and in, in that room that we were in at the university campus was that was almost deafening as well. And you could you could feel the energy and you like you said, you could feel the frustration. He was so dialed in that the second he felt either one of us letting up. He said more, more, more. I mean, he it was he was relentless, and I was so physically tired <laughs> that we ended up taking a late flight on Missoula. And I remember Heidi and I, we we had a glass of wine. That's all we did. We had a glass of wine. We toasted to the whole experience. And I remember sitting in the airplane seat. I don't remember buckling the seatbelt. And Heidi had to physically wake me up when we got to the gate. <laughs> <laughs> That's how physically tired I was because yeah. just go, 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 go. And I, you know, I think I, I, I mean, it's, it's when I, when I was listening back initially many years ago, you know, I was thinking that, um, you know, does it really capture the essence of what he wanted? And I, and I, I think it does. Um, I think it's one of those things that you also have to see my head turning bright red in a concert yeah. <laughs> to also experience it. But um, yeah, but we really went for it. And hopefully the intensity it, it is really what comes across that we just do not let up. So that is, I think, the hallmark of dad's writing is the the relentless character that you're talking about. And whether it's relentlessly loud or relentlessly soft, there's ah. something that he's trying to get to, um, trying to push you to your limit and then a little bit further so that the, there is nothing else in the universe except the sound in this moment. I mean, in the Eternal Garden, in the fourth movement, I think he probably added a good two, three, maybe even four minutes Mm. Of just hold, like you said, there's a one movement where I'm just playing so quiet <laughs> and reverse. It was absolutely reverse. Yeah. Where in that room, if he heard me at all give a little bit extra or a little crescendo, no, less, 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 less. And, and, and the fermatas, I mean, it's just I, I, uh, the Jason Schaefer of the Colorado Symphony, he called me up uh, when it was released and said, you know, had a lot of really nice things to say. And and he commented on, on how much longer the last movement is. And we started talking about it. And 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 I said the fermatas, especially, you know, we just held it for that reason, you know, not, not to take away from the three pieces, what you wanted to, you know, you wanted to talk about, but, but like, you know, reverse, it's, it's, it's the exact same thing. You know? Yeah. I mean, uh, I'm going to play a little bit of the eternal garden in, in, in a minute, but this, uh, that idea of, um, we're going to hold this a crazy long time because the sound needs to settle in the room. The sound needs to be right. You need to be in that place. It's not there yet. No. It's not there yet. No. Still not there. No. No. There it is. Okay, there it is. Okay, fine. <laughs> it really, yeah, it's, yeah, I, I've never experienced anything like that in my entire career. Uh, Every so, once in a while, you know, we'll be so display quieter or whatever, mm -hmm. but not for that extended, extended yeah. period of time, you know. And there's a part of the the amazing thing about his writing is that it supports that level of drawn outness. Yeah, like, it coheres. 
Yeah. Um, and that's due to a faith in your ability to be present. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. I wanted to play the, actually the next movement of three pieces just to get a sense of like, so there's the violence in the early music, but there's also an, like, an intuition of tonal harmony. Mm -hmm. There's an intuition of the, like, there's the roots where he found music interesting. Mm -hmm. cut it right too soon because <laughs> uh, it gets it gets even more beautiful it's, i know uh it's, it's 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 simple but yet it's so good like yeah it's so gorgeous so the really interesting thing for me is you need the same focus to play that as you do with all the nonsense that you've had to do for the previous right. movement right right and, like block chords themselves are some of the hardest things to do Yes. <laughs> um, yeah. And we had a discussion actually. Um, so my colleague, Warren Deck, who used to play in New York Philharmonic, he's a tuba, tuba professor and he was in the back. Um, and we had a nice long discussion about intonation mm. in this section. And I think, I, I mean, I think it's really important to know that to make sure I played in tune and really go for it. Um, I did, I did do some, what maybe some folks would consider a tad unconventional for some fingerings. Not that we have a lot of options, but whenever I could add keys or, um, or open up tone holes to get the pitch so I could really go for it, you know, cause the clarinet tends to go flat when you really, when you really go, um, I did everything I could in my power to do that. And then Heidi and I actually did spend a good couple of sessions just practicing our releases. So we could really keep, you know, we could, so we, could, we can work on sustaining. I also could work with her to, you know, get the kind of the shape of the piano and how the, how the piano sounds sometimes dissipate and stuff like that. Um, yeah, that's the kind of work we had to do for that section. So uh, when you're talking about releases, it, they are deeply undervalued. I find mm -hmm. like that is the difference between a good and a great ensemble work it's that you're stopping together. Yeah. And it's hard. You're absolutely right. Those, it's so hard. <laughs> you're, I mean, it's this, you know, this, this, this whole project and this whole like pre preparation and stuff, it, Again, it will, it will, it, because it will be, you know, one of the top experiences of my entire career, and it probably will be for my entire life, is because it really stretched me in every capacity as a musician, as a clarinetist, uh, you know, technical technique along with the musicianship, you know, control the instrument, you know, uh, all that stuff, and 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 that's your you you hit the nail right in the head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I the. The fourth piece for me, so uh, three pieces ends with this, it's a question mark of a, an ending yeah. where the, it ends with this sort of beautiful sonorities. And then the fourth piece takes up right where that left off yeah. and goes, we didn't answer that. And we need to open this case back up and see what's going on. So, I mean, the you get the, the block chords that we end with. Yeah that we then start with.
Okay. Um, but it's this, uh, uh, this sense that there's something here that we need to figure out. Uh, and one of the things that I find um, uh, maybe at the core of his music often is going to this hard place. No, there's more there. Yeah. No, there's still more there. We're going to take the time and see what's actually going on. Yeah, yeah it's that's yeah, absolutely. So uh, the in his early music, it's a lot about going into places of rage and trying to process. And the later music, it's about going into places of peace and letting those open up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when we start in Eternal Garden, it's a lot of the same dissonance that you find in the early music. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, which is, I hadn't heard in that way without the juxtaposition of the earlier music. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's as though he's going back to the early music and, and saying, it's okay it's it's okay now yeah. yeah yeah and that was you know it's it's i i hadn't thought about the chronological um in advance and it was actually it was actually albany records that wanted it in order in chronological i don't know maybe actually maybe you and i talked about it too i can't remember um but i hadn't i hadn't thought about the you know putting them in 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 order um but I, i'm glad we did because you can hear that you can hear the development, you can hear his lifespan, you know? Yeah. I often describe his musical output as one long meditation. Yeah. That it's how to be a person, how to be a creative person, how to open yourself up to the universe. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Uh, there are a couple of really cool effects that show up in different places. Um, uh, I wanted to, when I was listening through this time, we got to the second movement of uh, Eternal Garden, which is on Chestnut Hill. And I just started, the tears came. Oh. Yeah, uh, it's one of my very favorite things. This is also a callback to his uh, earlier piece, um, A Litany for St. Francis in the Seasons. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to just play a little bit of that. Uh, So this is also music from this time. It's you know the late 80s. Mm -hmm. And there's an incorporation of the previous music in a new context, something that I worked with a lot. So how did that come through in your performance? Those are some of the moments where I, I just I just really I really just like just enjoyed it. I was, uh, I enjoyed playing it. I enjoyed sinking my teeth into it, and I didn't. I didn't really. 
I don't know if I would, I would say I went that deep with, with moments like that, you know? I feel like I've gone into more of an analytical thing as maybe a defense mechanism in some ways. Um, is for my whole life, I've been immersed with this music. Yeah. And um, a lot of my own journey as a person has been about coming into real contact with my heart center uh, with my emotional truth. Yeah. And from, so I always knew that this stuff was there, but engaging with it on structural levels or on research or, or, or analytical levels was an easier way to in, integrate it. Yeah. To, to approach it. That makes sense. Yeah. And it's, so at this point, I have sort of the, the richness of like the connections that happen with the music. And I am, I find more easily opened to it now, which is a great blessing. Yeah. Um, but that opens up, that open, that will open up a lot of feelings, you know? It will. I mean, even, I mean, I'm even tearing up right now, just even listening to it, just thinking back. No, seriously. I'm, you know, I mean, it's, I mean, not to be overly dramatic, but it's true. I mean, you know, this, I know your father in a much different way than you do. Um, and this was a project that I was, you know, I mean, everybody knew at the time that I was doing this. I mean, everyone who knew me, yeah. knew I was doing this project because it just meant so much to me. It, you know, I mean, I had, I have a, I have a friend here who I went to school in Cincinnati with. He's a bassoon player turned urban planner. <laughs> <laughs> he's brilliant. He's absolutely brilliant. And he's has served in some capacity in the board of the Colorado Symphony. And he helped me write the grant because I had to get the grant. I, I mean, ev like everything about this project was, I have to do it. I have to do it. I have to do it. There was, there was nothing, you know, if there was anything in my way, there, if there's anything that felt like it was, in, that was getting in my way to stop me from doing this project, it was, I mean, it was just, it would like shatter my, like my month or my year or my day or whatever. And, you know, I mean, I have to say, I mean, and this is something that I don't, uh, it's part of my life now, but, you know, I mean, there's a couple of reasons why it took so long for me to get this project out. Um, you know, and part of it is that I, you know, I am a cancer survivor and, uh, you know, almost three years ago I was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and every time I sort of came around to like work on the project, it was like something almost got in the way. And, you know, and, and I have to say, Matthew, that going through the music and, you know, I mean, everything was fine with my treatment, everything's good. You know, I'm, I'm two years out, which is great. But when I was, when I was coming back to it. I have to, I mean, there was, there was a side of me, first of all, it was awesome to re, to go back into this music last summer and to start putting the finishing touches, um, during COVID. And, and then it was, it was, it was awesome. It was like, it was all for me. It was just like, it was like a, a beacon of light, if you will. It was always like this bright shining energy that was that it was always a pleasure to come back to. And it was great to listen to it over and over and over. And it was never old. It was never stale. You know, it was always refreshing. And, and, and it kind of hit me that I, I, I do kind of wonder if your father knew that the music needed to be released and into the world at this time. Mm. I really do. Um, you know, I went through all my garbage, unfortunately, you know, a after he passed away. Um, so I didn't have the opportunity to share these, these, this information with him or these experiences, which I think I would have, you know, yeah. to, get his, to get his insight and stuff like that. Um, but I, but I really do. And, and I, and I mean this, and I, I, I told Heidi this several times when we would talk about it and I would ask her opinion about stuff and I mean, just little things. And, um, and we had a really deep conversation about it that, we really, I really wonder if David knew that we were going to go through this crazy time in our history the past 14 months and, and we would just need something exciting and awesome to sort of, for us musicians to really latch onto, you know, mm. I really, I really do mean that. I really do. You so know? for a long time, he, he's discussed this in a, in a number of places, but the idea of 
coming to a time of crisis. Like, you know, you know, he could see the signs as well as anyone uh -huh. that everything is accelerating. Yeah. And so things are going to start to break down. Things are going to start to get crazy and chaotic and weird yeah. and difficult. And in one of his uh, last public appearances, uh, you know, he talks about you know, during times of crisis, you can either fight or you can sing and we yeah. choose to sing. Yeah. And what making music does is that it, it connects us in a way that no other power can, I think. Like, there's the people on stage making music together. There are the people in the audience listening to the music. And it is impossible to hate while making music. True. And so regardless of the chaos, regardless of the mess, what we can do is make this part of the world beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's, I mean, I... I that's how I feel about, you know, that's how I feel about the, the music coming out at this time. Honestly, I really do. You know, I really do. Yeah. Uh, so it's a, it's an important thing that you've done here. And I really wanted to thank you for it. Oh, thank you. Well, I, I, I appreciate that. Yeah, I do. So it's not just the music. It's the coming to grips with him personally and through and to to the music in the way that you have is something that very few people have had the opportunity or the courage to attempt and it's a great gift that you've given us wow. <laughs> don't make me tear up <laughs> um i really i mean I, I i appreciate it but honestly i mean the gift the gift was ours I mean, it really was. The gift was ours. The gift was, you know, to be, you know, to be in, you know, to experience this and 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 to go through the journey, you know. I mean, like I said, I mean, it's 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 when when I started thinking about this, I just became so obsessed. Yeah, I had to do it. I was, I had to do it. You know, it was. I don't know. I don't know what it was. Um, I don't know. But I had to, and I, I, I don't know if I've been, I mean, other than like trying to survive as a musician and yeah. make, sure, make sure I can, you know, I'll have a decent retirement or whatever, like, or like put food on the table. Um, I don't, I, I think there's been very few things that I've been so unbelievably obsessed with, you know, um, but it really, I mean, it was, it was amazing to sink, sink the teeth into and. Um, like I said, I mean, I was, I was equally inspired, you know, equally inspired by, by, by Heidi and Yumi and Basil, you know, I mean, they, they really, they really sunk. I mean, it was crazy. And when we were doing the trios, the movement with the, with, with the trio one with Basil, when, you know, she has to strum inside the piano, you know? So that? I wanted to, uh, talk about that because there's, uh, a few places where this auto harp thing comes in. Yes. There's yes. in Eternal Garden um, and then also in Images as well as the truth. Yes. And it's a te it's a timbre that I just forgot existed. Yeah. And, and how prevalent it was. Yeah. Uh, and it's just a cool thing. I'll, I'll just play a little bit here. Um, yeah. And there's this sense of like we want to do tonality, but we can't do straight tonality, especially <laughs> with this earlier music. We've got to do something weird with it. Right. And you know, I have to it's another little funny anecdote. I don't think I ever told Heidi this ever. Hmm. I don't think ever. 
but in, in preparing for it to try to get the sound that she wanted, mm -hmm. you know, she worked all sorts of different, um, you know, pencils or erasers or whatever she wanted. Right. And we had it set, like she had it set. And then the day of the recording, she comes in with more things. <laughs> She's still trying it out, still trying it out. And I wanted to, again, I just wanted to say, Heidi, you know, we already figured this out that you're going to drive me bonkers. Like, you know, oh my Lord. But again, I, Matthew, I have to keep on coming back and saying like, that's how everyone was so, like we just, it wasn't a matter of like wanting to get it right, but we really, we like, even to the bitter end to trying to really make sure we capture the essence of the music, you know? Yeah. I mean, it was just, I, I, I don't think I ever told her this and I, I probably should tell her this before this is, this gets aired. <laughs> but I mean, oh, I mean, I think back and I just thought to myself, Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. What is she doing to me? <laughs> so uh, speaking of Heidi, I wanted to, uh, play a little bit from the first trio just yeah. the the kind of virtuosity that she's able to bring to the table here yes and yes You cut off right before this amazing. Oh. Like after all that, and all of a sudden it's like. <laughs> all right, here we go. You know it's. <sighs> yeah, it's it's just this this delicacy of touch that she has, and uh, the. Uh, ability to get from very very loud to very soft and to carry that line through and i have i have never collaborated with anyone that has is able to play so loud <laughs> and that's uh, that's the, that is like that's another item that i i only i will experience that yeah because when we play this, I really play, I really like really stood more in the crook of the piano, you know, to really get the, you know, nice sound. And I will, all, I'll be one of the very few people and actually in your dad too, because, you know, cause the times when I sat on stage with us, you know, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, I mean, she just sometimes plays so loud, <laughs> <laughs> but, but yet, you know, so, you know, at times, I mean, I just, I, I, I admire about that. I admire that with any musician, there's an amazing clarinet player, Hawken Rosengren. And I remember um, he teaches at Cal State um, Fullerton. And and he reminds me of the same thing too. Some of his recitals I've attended of his, I just, uh, you know, the same, the, the same energy, the same spirit, the same control mastery of, it, of, of the instrument, you know? And uh, it was, I was very lucky. Uh, Heidi and I have been playing together. Well, she played for my interview here. And okay. And we've been inseparable ever since. So, which which has been really cool. So, I wanted to play a little bit of the uh, fourth movement. So, you're going to taste uh, the violin, like the lyricism that Yumi brings here. Yeah.
just beautiful stuff. Yeah, really okay. great. Yeah, it is. It, there's a liquid lushness to her sound all the way through. Yeah. Yep. Uh, the second trio, the there's this bit where you yell yes. in the middle of the thing. And you know, I never asked your father this, but I want to ask you this. If yeah. you where where did that come from? <laughs> yeah, I don't know, but my immediate reaction was both as a a wake up for the audience to say, look, I know this is like the fifteenth piece in this new music recital. <laughs> Just, just wake up. <laughs> hey. <laughs> yeah. And then, and after that, Heidi actually has to sing along, yeah. you know, and it's such a great texture. Actually. I think I don't, I don't think honestly it, it would have worked with a male voice. Uh, it creates a very, it's such an ethereal sound, you know? Uh, and then the, the viola sound as well. Yeah. It's just this, and the, the whole thing works beautifully. Let me get into this here. Um, Just a hell of a thing. Yeah. And then in this and then while Basil's doing his thing, her thing, Heidi puts um golf uh golf tees into the string. <laughs> you know? Which you can hear. It's not it's only like a very specific range, you know. Uh -huh. So you have to listen. It's it's a it's it all it doesn't sound like a toy piano, but um you have to listen really clo closely because it's but it's it's the the the, that particular range of the piano is surrounded by other stuff that Heidi's like bang on the piano and it's right in this very specific spot, you know? Ah, like it's worth listening along with the score. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, the, and the, not only is the viola sound, this is gorgeous thing. Like Basil's just, just knocking it out of the park, but the chamber work between you guys, the handoff between the notes is so effortless and smooth. Uh -huh. It's just a pleasure to hear. Oh, thank you. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Uh -huh. Also very hard. <laughs> For well, it's the kind of hard that results in a thing that sounds effortless. Hope which so. Is, which is the best sort of thing. Uh, hope so. Um, the, the the swan is gliding along while madly paddling beneath the surface. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, then we get into images. And I, again, the auto harp. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. But so this is uh, 1987. So this is right toward the the realization of I need to go to Montana because yeah. that's where things like I need. And you can hear him opening up. Yeah. And the music becomes more spare and more serene. Mm -hmm. There's a, if you look in the beginning of the third movement here, it's this kind of, he starts to strip down. And this is the starting point, I think, of the transition into the more simple music that he writes uh, going forward from this point.
there's a uh, this prefigures a lot of the music that he writes in the 90s with a kind of tonality and the paired back open harmonies and it's just a i didn't know it went back this far or mm. i didn't really like the roots it's like you always have to go back to go forward in some way yeah you get the uh, yeah So this is he changes the character yeah. so beautifully in there it's just a gorgeous thing gringo is uh, it's 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 an unbelievable piece yeah it really is the sounds and i what's the what's what's the one where it's just you me this movement for me i has a lot of angst yeah Yeah, and then she, it gets even higher and yeah. she goes even higher and it's like it's and that wailing that oh like that wailing sound like that of um yeah i don't know what it is i i i, I don't know how to really it's just it's ah it's it's and, and she's on the g-string the whole time it's just it also looks very uncomfortable <laughs> <laughs> And I also wonder if that also helps the music because well, as, yeah. as a clarinet player, I can imagine playing like this so high up and just like physically, it looks awful. <laughs> so wait, that's the ticket. Like the discomfort it means you have to lean into it and commit into it. Yeah. And, and she does, you mean like she really did like, like you just, yeah, it's great. Awesome. Uh, so there's a personal parallel here. So this piece is written in 1987. My sister was born in 85. Oh. And um, in the, the ninth movement here is uh, the song mom sang to us as kids. Seriously? Yeah. I did not know that. So interesting. Go, go to sleep, rest your head. Huh. Go to sleep, my little baby. Huh. He never yeah. told us that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you find the songs that mom sang sprinkled all the way through his music. Seriously. Yeah. So in the phoneme concerto that he wrote for me there's a, a movement called the water is wide and it's the it's the spiritual 
but it's the way mom's saying it because huh? she put in in a couple of, she makes it five four in a couple of places because she wanted yeah. to hold it out yeah and for dad i think mom my mom allison was the grounding the you know his link to the earth his link to reality in a lot of ways like he lived in the clouds and she lived in in the world yeah and there's a deep rootedness to these songs that he found um, especially captivating amazing so yeah this has been just an absolute pleasure to to experience thank you and 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 it's been it was an absolute pleasure and will continue to be um our wind ensemble director actually asked if i would play the i think the second concerto next year oh fantastic so um yeah it's been like i said before it, it was a real gift um I haven't spoken to Peggy D's in a while, but I'll probably give her a buzz in a couple of days, you know, and again, thank her for, for involving uh, me in the, the eternal garden commission that sort of, you know, kicked off the whole thing. But um, yeah, it's been, it's been such a real pleasure and I will always remember it with uh, a lot of fond memories, you know? Well, you have a, a monument of passion here. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a little crazy sometimes too, but <laughs> yeah. What interesting thing ever got done by normal people? <laughs> That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Uh, so. but it's been uh, lovely to talk with you. You too. Yeah, this is great. I'm so glad. This is a great idea. Um, it's been great to relive it again. Any and I love I love talking about my experience in this music and and any opportunity to share. Uh, I'm just I love it. I can't. I can't get enough of it. Um, it's like the finest of wines or the, the finest of, of, of anything, you know, it's yeah. just, it's just great. It's just awesome. Uh, there's always more there, the more you look at it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what I was saying before, like, you know, when I, when I finally last summer said, okay, I really have to, I really want this to get out into the world. You know, it was just, again, like coming back to it, you know, listening to it, um, it, it, like, I, I feel like I heard new things. I feel like I experienced slightly different feelings or slightly different emotions, um, truly. And it was, it was, it was really spectacular, you know, and I think, you know, it's, it's timeless. It's really great. Yeah. Uh, where can people find you online? Folks can, um, you know, find me on the University of Denver Lamont School of Music website, Folks can email me through uh, through the university. That's just fine if they want to reach out. Absolutely, um, yeah. And I have and I have a couple other recordings as well on YouTube as well if they're interested in some other stuff. Um, one of the reasons why it took a little, one thing was that I I I premiered some uh, some stuff uh, for viola and clarinet that was written for us. Uh, Kenji Bunch and Libby Larson wrote wrote a, wrote, wrote some stuff for us, and so. Um, that was another reason why, but um, this also sort of got like a little delayed a little bit too. So, but um, yeah, I think the best way to contact is through the university website. Thank you again, and uh, I'm excited to to have this in the world. Me too. Me too. I and yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Oh. Great. Uh, Thank you so much, Matthew. Really appreciate it.